For over 35 years now, the Final Fantasy franchise has combined compelling storytelling with cutting-edge gameplay and graphics, creating a catalogue of now iconic games that have spanned multiple console generations. Some of these experiences include fan favourites such as Final Fantasy IV, X, and more recently, Final Fantasy XIV. But none of these quite stack up to the impact of Final Fantasy VII. This stands as the most well-known and recognised Final Fantasy game, and it has endured as a beloved game by not only fans of the series, but also the wider gaming community at large. This adoration has seen Square expand its story beyond the confines of the original game via the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, and more recently via the Final Fantasy VII Remake project. This focus has caused Final Fantasy VII to cast a large shadow over the other entries in the series, and few games have felt this effect more than its direct predecessor, Final Fantasy VI. In fact, after Final Fantasy VII, it could be argued that Final Fantasy VI is the entry in the series with the most reverence amongst the hardcore, and it holds a special place in the hearts of anyone lucky enough to grow up with it back in the mid-1990s. As the last mainline Final Fantasy game to release in the 16-bit era, Final Fantasy VI benefited from all the games that had come before it. Released in 1994 on the Super Nintendo, Final Fantasy VI featured the series' most refined and polished gameplay to date. Hiroyuki Ito, who was promoted to co-director, worked with a select team to create a finely tuned version of the active time battle system that spanned a plethora of characters and abilities. Gameplay was then complemented by a mature and involved story which was overseen by the game's other co-director, Yoshinori Kitaze. The pair worked together to create one of the deepest and most complex role-playing games ever seen to this point and it all centred around the exploits of its large ensemble cast, which represented a wide variety of experiences and offered players a world of choice when it came to selecting their party composition. With this cast, Final Fantasy VI managed to tell a story that focused on war, love, and the struggle to survive, creating a captivating experience that remains enthralling to this day. And we'd be remiss not to mention that Final Fantasy VI also gave the series one of its most memorable antagonists in the form of Kefka Palazzo, the cruel and erratic jester turned god. Though reception for Final Fantasy VI was very positive upon release, and sales records were broken in Japan, the same level of financial success was not seen when the game launched in North America, and its performance was considered disappointing by senior figures at Square. But, as time has gone on, Final Fantasy VI has endured as one of the most popular entries in the series for both fans and critics alike. Development on the game started in earnest following the release of Final Fantasy V, and despite a not insignificant increase in scope, it was completed both on time and within budget. However, the team at Square endured long hours and a relentless schedule to get the game out of the door on time. It's perhaps for this reason that Final Fantasy VI launched with quite a few bugs. They just weren't found due to the size of the project and the inefficient quality assurance process being used at the time, which often related to no longer active development personnel, such as artists, being asked to play specific segments of the game relentlessly in different ways to try and see what broke. Future re-releases of Final Fantasy VI saw some of these issues ironed out, and luckily, the average experience of the game improved with each and every new version. The PlayStation version, for example, which was released in the NTSC regions in 1999, and then for the first time ever in PAL regions in 2002, saw a number of localization issues fixed over the Super Nintendo version, and new CGI cutscenes were included. Final Fantasy VI Advance saw further improvements, with yet another localization pass and a ton of bonus content. And despite the Game Boy Advance's smaller screen and resolution, the graphics were touched up and made much more vibrant. Future re-releases would use the Game Boy Advance version as their base, but would still feature updated graphics and UI tweaks to make everything more user-friendly. And these remain the versions pushed out by Square Enix until the release of the Final Fantasy VI Pixel Remaster in 2022. 
Through each of these re-releases, the reverence of Final Fantasy VI has only continued to grow. By 2008, when combining global sales across all re-released platforms to that point, Final Fantasy VI stood as the 88th best-selling video game produced by a Japanese company. This placed it ahead of the likes of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, the original Resident Evil, and Chrono Trigger. And it suggested that even though the original sales of Final Fantasy VI on the Super Nintendo weren't all that strong in North America, the inclusion of the PlayStation and Game Boy Advance re-releases had made a real difference. But the reference was also reflected within the popular critical consciousness, as Final Fantasy VI started to feature as a modern masterpiece. And this was reflected by its high placement within Final Fantasy-centric rankings, where mainline entries would be pitted against each other, but also wider lists compiling the greatest games of all time. This has then fueled demand for Final Fantasy VI to receive more time in the spotlight, as while the Pixel Remaster was well received, the brief 2D HD upgrade in graphical fidelity for the opera scene didn't quite scratch the itch. Fans wanted more. They wanted a full-on remake. Interestingly enough though, the story of a potential remake for Final Fantasy VI begins a lot further back than many would suspect and it's intrinsically linked to the story of the original Final Fantasy VII. Following the release of Final Fantasy VI in 1994, Square began to plan out where to take the series next. Numerous options were on the table, but initial plans for a quick Super Famicom follow-up were shelved as Chrono Trigger encountered technical difficulties and additional support was needed. Final Fantasy VI still lingered, however. Assets were used during the initial prototyping phase of Final Fantasy VII, with Locke appearing in a pixelated town that looked similar to the graphical style used in Chrono Trigger. And with Square also having an eye on emerging technologies, Final Fantasy VI became the focal point for their internal testing. Those tests manifested via Final Fantasy VI, the interactive CG game. Unveiled at SIGGRAPH 95, this demo featured a fight between Final Fantasy VI characters and a golden golem type monster. Designed to show off a reimagined combat system and what 3D encounters would look like on Nintendo's upcoming console, this demo seemed to hint at what fans could expect from Final Fantasy going forward and also what a 3D version of Final Fantasy VI could have looked like. Unfortunately, this demo never amounted to anything more than just a technical showcase and it wouldn't be until the 2006 release of Final Fantasy III on the Nintendo DS that the topic of a Final Fantasy VI remake would re-emerge in earnest. After suffering from years of development hell, Square, and then Square Enix, decided to shelve first a remake of Final Fantasy III on the Wonderswan Color, and then on the Game Boy Advance. Focus then moved instead to producing a full-on, 3D remake that could leverage the technical capabilities of Nintendo's upcoming console, the Nintendo DS. Upon launch, the Final Fantasy III Remake proved that a 3D remake of an older Final Fantasy game could not only succeed, but do so in spades. And due to how well it had been done, and the nature of the game that had served as the benchmark, production of a remake on Final Fantasy IV started with immediate haste. After the release of Final Fantasy IV, many fans assumed that Square Enix and Matrix Software would turn their attentions towards producing remakes for Final Fantasy V and VI. But when everyone reconvened, they had a rather different idea about what their next foray onto the Nintendo DS should be. Instead of diving into the past and attempting to modernise another old game, there was a belief that the knowledge gained from working on the two remakes could be applied to create something original, the first true Final Fantasy spin-off in what had been a considerable period of time. It led to Square Enix facing something of a quandary. They wanted to reward Tomoyo Asano and Takashi Tokita for their efforts in producing the Final Fantasy 3 and 4 remakes. But on the other hand, they would be leaving money on the table by not remaking Final Fantasy 5 and 6. They therefore decided to try and do both, but even though Asano and Tokita were able to fulfil their objective by producing Final Fantasy The Four Heroes of Light, Square Enix were unable to fulfil theirs. Matrix Software was a very handy development partner, and they were the ideal partner to work on the Final Fantasy V and VI remakes. But with them occupied by the Asano team, 
Square Enix attempted to recreate their output themselves and struggled. In 2010, a year after the Four Heroes of Light had released, Shinji Hashimoto addressed this by saying that even though they had explored remaking Final Fantasy V and VI, they had encountered technical difficulties. Hashimoto therefore suggested that fans shouldn't hold their breath. Hashimoto then clarified this statement a few months later by saying that due to how much time had passed, Square Enix were considering a different approach. He noted, rather than creating 5 or 6 for the current DS, we want to take a look to see how the 3DS does, how it evolves, and then make a decision. However, after this, the notion of a Final Fantasy VI remake was essentially swept under the carpet. That was, until the Final Fantasy VII remake was announced five years later. In the days following the mind-blowing announcement, Tetsuya Nomura was interviewed by VentureBeat. The subject of the other remakes came up, and Nomura noted, I've been working with Mr. Kataze since Final Fantasy V, and we've noticed that V and VI are missing. That bothers me. How can we skip over those two? This then stoked the imagination of fans again, and more and more media outlets started talking about the prospect of a Final Fantasy VI remake and how feasible it would be. Some just wanted a much better 16-bit adaptation, while others wondered about a remake that mirrored the approach taken by Final Fantasy VII. Square Enix themselves had even entertained such thoughts. In 2017, Kitase noted in an interview with Famitsu that while they were working on the Final Fantasy VII remake, staff within the company had also voiced a preference to work on Final Fantasy VI. This admission was what fans had been waited for, and from this point on, Kitase would be peppered with questions from journalists and pleas to remake Final Fantasy VI. But in the past 12 months, with focus back on Final Fantasy VII in a big way, Kitase has spoken numerous times about the topic. During an official roundtable event to promote the Pixel Remaster collection, Kitase spoke on the topic of a Final Fantasy VI remake in an official capacity. He reiterated that while there were many fans of Final Fantasy VI internally at Square Enix, he would love to work on such a project. Making that dream a reality would prove to be a difficult task, especially as he was still deep in development on the Final Fantasy VII Remake trilogy. Expanding upon the idea in January 2024 via an interview with French YouTuber Julien Chies, Kataze explained in more detail that the reason a Final Fantasy VI remake would be so difficult to make was because of the size of the cast and the overall scope of the project. He even speculated that such an undertaking would take nearly 20 years to complete when going by the development time standard set by the Final Fantasy VII Remake trilogy. That being said, there might be some hope. While Kataze stands by his assertions that a remake in the style of Final Fantasy VII would be a massive and time-consuming project for Square Enix to undertake, in an interview with Eurogamer a month after, he did suggest that he will be open to a remake of the game in the 2D HD style. This sort of remake, however, was not something he personally seemed to have too much of a desire to be part of, suggesting to Eurogamer that he'd love to see a different development team at Square Enix handle such an effort if the opportunity were to present itself. It therefore creates yet another quandary. There is a clear desire within Square Enix to remake both Final Fantasy V and VI. But as the Final Fantasy brand manager and original co-director of Final Fantasy VI, Kitase seems to have no desire to greenlight such a project. Square Enix has also expressed interest in slimming down their concurrent development projects going forward, meaning that if leaks and rumours relating to Final Fantasy Tactics and Final Fantasy IX are indeed true, it leaves little room for a full-blown Final Fantasy VI remake, at least anytime soon. There has also been a considerable desire from within Square Enix to produce Final Fantasy X 3 after the completion of the Final Fantasy VII Remake project. And this then leaves Final Fantasy VI in a bit of a weird place. The Pixel Remaster version of the game was intended as the definitive experience for the title going forward, but given the continued success of the Final Fantasy III and IV remakes, which are still on sale, there is a clear appetite for something similar with Final Fantasy V and VI. The internal belief within Square Enix seems to be that if it's going to be done, it has to be at the same scale as how Final Fantasy VII is being remade, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. 
not everything has to be a AAA blockbuster to be well received and meaningful. But what do you think? Is Final Fantasy VI long overdue for the remake treatment? Or do you think Square Enix has too much on their plate at the moment? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube members and supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Gregory, Justin Dent and Sukun TDK, who are super special Onion Knight supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.